needs followers of his son wherever he has placed you i'm talking a courthouse i'm talking ingles i'm talking the schoolhouse i'm talking the arboretum i'm talking hope city fellowship i'm talking the hood i'm talking the mountain i'm talking the city i'm talking the country wherever god has placed us this is how you make an impact do it with all your heart one of the reasons god loves to allow you to get thrown in front of somebody with your pants down is because he knows he's going to rescue you and he's going to live powerfully in your heart as a matter of fact oh this is good this is good family John chapter 8, verse 11. No one, sir, she said, then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Now go and leave your life of sin. The title of our message this morning is Optical Illusion. When I was a little boy, my mama was a gangster, so to speak. <laughs> she was one of those types of single moms that did what she had to do to get the job done. Can I get a witness? One of the things that she did was she picked up a second job delivering newspapers. And if I got up early enough with her, I had the blessing of going on the paper route with my mama super early in the morning before the sun even came up. And I remember one of the things I loved to do was once the sun came up, I would keep one of the newspapers and I would turn to the section that had the word puzzles and the comics and the optical illusions. And the way that the optical illusions worked is you grab the paper and you got you to pull it really close to your face. You got to concentrate on this graphic and you pull it back real slow. And if you do it just right, the key is to not blink. You blink, it's over. You got to start over. All right. So you pull it back real slow. And if you do it just right, an image emerges. Who knows what I'm talking about? The image is somewhat of a message from the artist. You see this image and the image will make you smile as a message of sorts from the artist. Interestingly, some of the writers of the Bible called Jesus the image of the invisible God. I want you to see a couple spots. Yeah, look at Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. The Son is the image of the invisible visible God the firstborn over all creation meaning it belongs to him as if he's the oldest if you will although the scriptures teach us it's not so much he's the oldest it's simply that he has inherited it all so Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being sustaining all things by his powerful word Jesus himself he had one of his disciples they said okay 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 we've been with you for these years you've been doing crazy things Jesus show us the father and he said John chapter 14 he said Yo, have I been with you so long, 
you don't know that if you've seen me, you've it's okay. If you've seen me, you've seen the father. What was he saying? He was saying, I look just like the father in heaven. If you've seen me, you've essentially seen him. I ran into a dude just a couple of weeks ago and I'm talking with the dude. I'm like, bro, I promise I know you from somewhere. Bro, where do I know you from? He's like, I don't know. You kind of look familiar. I'm not, I'm not. Bro, I know you from somewhere. We figured it out. I knew his daddy. He looked just like his daddy. Now, we're in this message series that we've entitled, I've Decided to Follow Jesus. And that is such great news. If that's how you feel, you need to help me make some noise right now. I've decided to follow Jesus. Hallelujah. Now, what we've been doing in the series is we're saying, okay, if that's you, or if that's somebody and you're thinking about that, what does it look like now to follow Jesus? How, how do you do that? In week one, KCC, we said that to follow Jesus, it looks like, first and foremost, remembering that Jesus saves us from the judgment. The primary reason we follow Jesus, that's a lot of benefit. Can I get a witness? The primary reason is he saves us from the judgment of our sins. Hallelujah. Week two, we said followers of Jesus should have their own Bible, preferably a study Bible where you can learn God's word. And like the psalmist says, Psalm 1, he said, yo, learn God's word and meditate on it. So many benefits. And he specifically talks about how if you meditate on God's word regularly, you'll mess around and find that your mind and your heart will grow their roots down into God. And even when something in life crazy happens, it might hurt, but you're going to be good because you're rooted in him. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. Last week, we shared a message and we talked about how every follower of Jesus needs to find your people. Preferably a healthy local church. Where you can contribute to and receive from the collective protection that comes from it. And particularly protection from the dangers of pride. And an enemy for real who prowls around looking for somebody to devour. Look to your neighbor and say, you're looking like a snack. Come on, somebody. <laughs> all right. All right. Week number four. Today, God has given me a message to share. And what I want to share with you is that every follower of Jesus... What that looks like is making God visible. Especially for those who so desperately need him. How many know that's all of us, actually? I would go a little bit further and I'd say following Jesus means being a vessel that makes the incredible, invisible, intangible God credible. That means believable. Visible and tangible. And I want to show you, yeah, a passage of scripture where there was a woman who was in a situation that was quite graphic. But if you actually zoom out from this situation that was popping off, you'll see an image of a God. It was quite different than what the people thought. The gospel, according to John, chapter 8, and verse 1 reads, Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives, but early the next morning, he was back again at the temple. A crowd soon gathered, and he sat down and taught them. As he was speaking, the teachers of religious law and Pharisees brought a woman 
who had been caught in the act of adultery, they put her in front of the crowd. Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? They were trying to trap him into saying something they could use against him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote in the dust with his finger. They kept demanding an answer. So he stood up again and said, all right, but let the one who has never sinned, I'm actually, yes, thank you, in the NLT, throw the first stone. Then he stooped down again and wrote in the dust. When the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest, until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No. Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I. Go. And sin no more. Optical illusion. What we see in this graphic situation, it's important to recognize that this woman, it's likely forcibly grabbed while she was in the act. Probably completely undressed. They say, in order to help yourself speak in front of people. Just imagine everybody in their underwear. It doesn't really help. <laughs> but it's far worse if you're the only one in your underwear and everybody is looking at you. Have you ever been in a situation where you kind of got caught with your pants down, so to speak. Have you ever been in a situation where you got really close to getting caught with your pants down? Have you ever been on that edge of a situation and you were very aware how fragile you yourself and your strength and your doing the right thing can be at times? Interestingly, the woman gets drugged before Jesus, but the man is nowhere to be found. Now, it is true that the Old Covenant scriptures did require that certain sins were dealt with extremely forcefully. This was a way for God to keep his people on track with very firm expectations. How many know what I'm talking about? Parents, those of us who have children, it's very important that we give our children direction. And there are certain things where we say this here is so important. 
I'm telling you, do not for your own good. Do not walk across that front yard and get on that street. Do not. Daddy, you sound a little mean. I'm being forceful because it matters. Are we together? There were some things that God put a particular gravity on to keep his covenant people distinct from the rest of the nations so that they would not get so polluted and corrupted that the Messiah could not come into the world through this particular community that we now call the Hebrews. But when Jesus gets on the scene, those who God had entrusted as leaders and shepherds of the people had become corrupt. Need to take my time for a few minutes. As a matter of fact, by the time Jesus gets on the scene, God is actually up to something extremely important that you need to know in order to understand what we're looking at today. God had actually decided to remove the authority that he had given to the leadership at the time. And to give it to someone he could trust. As a matter of fact, the first principle I want you to write down today is the word replace. God had decided that those who he had entrusted to lead his people had become so insular and self-serving rather than leading the flock. They were fleecing the flock. That God said, I love my people too much. I'm going to replace you with somebody I trust. Now, I'm going to read a scripture here. And I want you to see something very important. It's all over the Old Testament. I'm going to show you one place where God spoke through a prophet named Ezekiel. Everybody say Ezekiel. Ezekiel. And Ezekiel speaking for Yahweh, Yahweh says something very interesting. You're going to see it. He says, I'm going to strip the authority of the shepherds who exist right now because you've been tripping too hard. I love my people too much. And he says some interesting things. On the one hand, he says, I myself am going to be their shepherd. Then he says, I'm going to allow a descendant of David to be the shepherd. And when he does, he's going to live forever. Now, make up your mind, Yahweh. How does that work? How are you going to be the shepherd? But a descendant of David is going to be a shepherd. And he's going to be a shepherd forever. He's just going to be a man. Maybe not. Cryptic in the scriptures, God was foretelling about a man named Jesus Christ. Woo! You ought to make some noise. Who was going to come and he would show the world the heart of a father. The father. Ezekiel chapter 34 verse 11. If you're with me, say amen. For this is what the sovereign Lord Yahweh says. I myself will search and find my sheep. I will be like a shepherd looking for his scattered flock. I will find my sheep and rescue them from all the places where they were scattered on that dark and cloudy day. I will bring them back home to their own land of Israel from among the peoples and nations. I will feed them on the mountains of Israel and by the rivers and in all the places where people live. Yes, I will give them good pasture land on the high hills of Israel. There they will lie down in pleasant places and feed in the lush pastures of the hills. I myself will tend my sheep and give them a place to lie down in peace, says the sovereign Yahweh. Stay with me. I will search for my lost ones who strayed away and I will bring them safely. Somebody say safely home again. I will bandage the injured and strengthen the weak. This is our God. Hallelujah. But I will destroy those who are fat and powerful. I will feed them. Yes, feed them justice. Hallelujah. And as for you, my flock, this is what the sovereign Yahweh says to his people. I will judge between one animal of the flock and another, separating the sheep from the goats. I don't have time to give that justice, but I will say 
We don't have to worry about making sure people are doing everything right. We just need to be on the right side. God will separate the sheep and the goats. Let him be God. Can I get a witness? Isn't it enough for you to keep the best of the pastures for yourselves? Must you also trample down the rest? Isn't it enough for you to drink clear water for yourselves? Must you also, must you also muddy the rest with your feet? Why must my flock eat what you have trampled down and drink water you have fouled? Therefore, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I will surely judge between the fat sheep and the scrawny sheep. For you fat sheep pushed and butted and crowded my sick and hungry flock until you scattered them to distant lands. So I will rescue my flock and they will no longer be abused. I will judge between one animal of the flock and another. And I will set over them one shepherd, my servant David. He will feed them and be a shepherd to them. And I, Yahweh, will be their God and my servant David will be a prince among my people. I, the Lord, have spoken. Do you see the beautiful cryptic truth in this picture? Whoa, 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 wait. God, you're going to be a shepherd to your people, but you're going to send a shepherd who's in the line of David to be the shepherd. How does this make sense? I know a man named Jesus. Come on, somebody. A man named Jesus who's not just a man. See, when we decide to follow Jesus, we're not just following a man. I desire to be a great man. I'm not a nice guy. Please do not ever insult me. Call me a nice guy. I'm not a nice guy. I aspire to be a very good man. But I'm just a man. But I follow a man who is the God man. Come on, somebody. Who is a shepherd who interestingly shows us God the Father's Heart So much so when he had a woman thrust in front of him in the middle of teaching the people. Now imagine this. We're here today. I have the privilege this morning of sharing the word of God. It's going to bless you in just a minute. Hallelujah. Let me calm down. It's going to bless you. I have the privilege of sharing right now. Imagine some of my what they call in the streets, the ops. My ops show up. My critics Some haters. I don't talk about haters much, but I do have some. I don't like to talk about it because I like to be positive. But let's say one of my or one of your haters wants to trap a brother king, brings a woman in the middle of my thing, throws her down. She's completely naked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jesus, you talk a whole lot about grace, but we got you this time. Ain't no way you can get out of this one. The law of Moses says... We caught her. We got the receipts. We caught her in the very act of adultery. What do you say? We got them this time. Everybody shake your hands like this right here. Oh, yeah. We got them. We got them. We got them. Jesus, so boss level. Jesus, such a grown man. Jesus, so great. Jesus, so unmoved by pettiness. Jesus didn't give an answer right away. We could do well to take some lessons there. We don't have to respond to everything. Says he stoops down and he starts writing in the dust with his finger. Jesus, didn't you hear us? We caught her. Now, what would happen if Jesus were to say, yes, stoner? They'd have something against him because the Jews at the time were not permitted to execute people who were capital punishment level criminals. They didn't have that permission from the Romans. So if Jesus says, yes, do what the scripture says, what happens? They report them to the Romans. They lock them up. Won't let me out. Okay. If he says, no, don't stone her. Some way he can get out of this. What happens? You're not truly a teacher of Yahweh, because you're clearly contradicting the word of Yahweh. So what does Jesus do? He gives a brilliant reply. Let's 
That's off his finger. All right. This is how we'll do it. Let the person who's never sinned throw the first one. Now, apparently, the way Jesus said it was so impactful that his opposition was moved in the heart. What you began hearing, I want you to brace yourself for this. One at a time. From the oldest to the youngest. An awareness. See, when you're so cold-blooded, you don't have to tell everybody you're cold-blooded. Jesus didn't have to say much more, but they knew he knew. In 2015, there was a data leak from a website called Ashley Madison. Millions of people gone on to AshleyMadison.com. And it was a way to secretly, guaranteed secrecy, Find someone to have an affair with. Somebody was able to break into the website and leaked millions of names and numbers and information. I remember thinking to myself, one, man, this is about to get real messy. There were politicians, Christian leaders, world-renowned Christian leaders. I remember thinking to myself, thank God I have never crossed certain lines, but I know myself enough to know I'm not too saved for my name to have not been on that list. Come on, somebody. I have found that there are a couple really good things that happen when God allows someone to get thrown down in front of him with their pants down. I'll tell you a few. Have you noticed that when you're doing pretty good, following Jesus, honoring him, not looking at porn, maybe you got a couple good days or weeks or months under your belt and, you know, hadn't been tripping too hard with the alcohol or I've been cutting down on the weed, been pretty solid doing my time with God. And, you know, when I go out, I, been going out, but I haven't been really going too far. Not really my Christian friends, but I'm going out with some worldly friends, you know, but I'm representing Jesus for the most part. I've been cussing a little bit, you know what I'm saying, and might mess around and, you know, but I've been doing pretty good, and the better you get at honoring God, sanctification, come on somebody, we, we believe in sanctification, we believe in holiness, come on somebody, we believe in godliness, but the more godly we tend to get 
the more self-righteous we tend to get. I'm preaching right now. I have found in my own self, I be forgetting how much God done forgave me for. Second principle I want you to get out of our message today. I want you to write down the word really good. (laughs) I think there are some good reasons why God actually allows people to get caught with our pants down, thrown in front of him, sometimes even in front of the world. I want to give you an analogy before I get there. We've got to turn the corner here and close. But I want to share with you about what it looks like to be really good at what you do. Okay? Now, we could use this relative to sports. We could use this relative to music, Bruce Liam. We could use this relative to your work. I walked into the courthouse on Tuesday. I had jury duty. I walked into the courthouse hoping that somebody was going to give me grace. There is this absolutely spiritually beautiful woman. She must have been in her 60s. Beautiful woman spiritually. I walk in and this woman says, good morning. We are so glad that you are here this morning. How can I help you? I thought, man, this woman, this is a nice lady. I'm talking with the woman and I say, I'm really hoping I can get this thing deferred. I got a lot of people that I help day to day. Is there any way? She said, well, what do you do for work? I may be able to defer it, but everybody's got to serve. If you're an American, everybody's got to serve. That'll preach right there. If you're an American, everybody's got to serve, but perhaps I could defer it into the future. What do you do for work? I said, I'm a pastor. She said, I could tell there was a connection I felt in my heart. I said, that makes a lot of sense. I'm telling you, you exude the light of God. We had a nice conversation. She let me defer until sometime next year. But suffice to say, did you know and would you agree that to be really good at something, it requires that you, I would say, are competent. We could call that science. The science of what you do, you got to be competent in it. You also have to bring in an art. It's not just about doing the thing, but it involves doing it in a dynamic way. Let me give you an example with music. When it comes to playing music, you can play the music technically right. I'm going somewhere with this. If you're with me, say amen. If I were to play this song with no art, all science, that's technically correct. There's no art to it. Does this make sense? This is science meeting art. together but to really be good at what you do you don't only need science and art you need heart praise the one risen son oh praise the one I think one of the reasons God allows us to get caught with our pants down is because when he gives us grace, when we've had our pants down, it plunges us deeper into him. Come on, somebody. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. 
What I mean by that is I have found that when I be forgetting my sin and my struggles and my weakness and I compare all of my sin to y'all's sin, I, I, yeah, yeah, I sometimes, I should say, when I compare my public sin to y'all's sin, I can kind of forget and I get away from experiencing God in my heart because, yeah, yeah, it's just the science and the art of life. And I'm here to tell you, God actually desires. What's this? Whoa, this is good. I got to go. This is good. But what's this? Followers of Jesus, we are called to embody Jesus's love. Now, how can I embody Jesus's love if I don't actually experience his love in my heart? Does this make sense? What's this? What's this? God needs followers of his son wherever he has placed you. I'm talking a courthouse. I'm talking Ingalls. I'm talking the schoolhouse. I'm talking the Arboretum. I'm talking Hope City Fellowship. I'm talking the hood. I'm talking the mountain. I'm talking the city. I'm talking the country. Wherever God has placed us, this is how you make an impact. Do it with all your heart. One of the reasons God loves to allow you to get thrown in front of somebody with your pants down is because he knows he's going to rescue you and he's going to live powerfully in your heart. As a matter of fact, oh, this is good. This is good, family. I've noticed that a lot of Christians just go through the motions. You see the dude on the side of the, the interstate. You get off the interstate, you get on the off ramp. And the dude just blends in with the concrete. Because there's no heart. There's no love. I got out at Starbucks just on Friday meeting with one of the beautiful sister queens in our church, Jay Spice, and her great man, grown man, Dan, and I got out and there was a dude with a table and he was basically giving some information and, and hoping to get donations for a drug abuse prevention program. And he catches eyes with me and I almost started crying. I said, I want to donate. He said, I hadn't told you anything yet. I said, I want to donate. He said, that would be awesome. This will help us out a lot. I, I, I got to meet somebody in about three minutes. Can I come back in a few minutes and make a donation? He said, absolutely. Hour later, he said, I want that right there. I'm going to pay that much. He said, man, I didn't have to convince you. I said, I had a cousin who I grew up with who died of a drug overdose couple months ago. This is really important. I feel this in my heart. My brothers and my sisters, as I close, following Jesus looks like getting really good at whatever it is that you do and doing it from your heart and remembering That day. Where Jesus saved you. My grandfather, he served in the Vietnam War. And my mother and my aunts and uncles, they talk about how one time they were all in the house just kidding around, wrestling around, and somebody slammed the door. He ran into the room. Everybody get down! And he took his hand. He went to the light bulb, and he crushed it with his bare hand. He thought he was on the battlefield. It's been called Vietnam Syndrome, also known as PTSD where the sound of something triggered him to remember when he was on the battlefield. 
And I'm here to tell you, God is so good. He actually will give me and you the grace to remember. I said the grace. Pick up those stones for me, family. The grace to remember that day when you got caught with your pants down and Jesus came in and rescued you by grace. So much so, I believe that that woman, every time she heard something that sounded like this right here, she remembered. And she said to herself, I believe she went on to be a powerful disciple and difference maker. I believe that she, every time she heard something that sounded like that, she remembered that day and she said, if that is what God is like, sign me up. I want to know and I want to go for him. Verse 11, as we close. No one, sir, she said, then neither do I condemn you. Jesus declared, go and leave your life of sin. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. When people know and see us, they should see an image of the image of the invisible God. I'm talking, we should be people of radical grace. We should be people of radical love. We should be people of radical forgiveness. We should be people who remember God's grace to us and we help those who are down there with their pants down. Come on, somebody. We must be a church who loves people like Jesus. And here's the key. It's not religion. It's simply remembering you and I are the woman. So we can help the woman. Let's give God praise. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.